body of phantoms and monsters. They exist among us, and sometimes they win. Even the devil was an angel once. The world has its own rules, and these rules are not human. Some of us seek answers to the origin and existence of cryptids and the unexplained. Join us as we venture beyond the known and accepted boundaries. Welcome to our nightmare. I think you're going to like it. Folks, good evening and welcome to the start of Phantoms and Monsters Radio, where we explore the unexplained live on YouTube. I'm your host, Lon Stricter, coming to you within a cannon shot of the Howell Fields of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and thanks for joining us. Now, Phantoms and Monsters Radio channel is made possible by you liking, subscribing, and sharing our programming. Super chat donations are essential for us to continue offering you our unique content and your consideration is very much appreciated. So tonight, we have Tobias Whalen and Manuel Navarrete of the Families of Monsters 14 research team. Um, Tobias is the publisher and chief bottle washer over the Singular 14 Society. And uh, to, uh, Manuel also runs UFO Clearing House. So, guys, thanks for coming on this evening. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, you know, I, I, I was trying to figure out where we left off at the last time we were together. Now, I, I, I know we had talked about a bit about the, um, the unseen ones, the winged ones and such. And uh, but the last we the one the last case that came the case that came after the last time we were together was this uh wing being that was seen uh in a I guess it was a southwestern part of the airport. Uh, it was reported by Manuel, uh, report, you know, seen by a security guard, and there was also a large boomerang UFO, um, uh, as well. So, Manuel, why don't you tell us a bit about that, Kate? Okay. Well, the gentleman was the uh, – he is one of the uh, security guards out there, um, private security firm. Um, his job was to basically uh, watch over a um, – it's kind of like an asphalt processing plant, one of those mobile um, asphalt plants that they have set up around the airport uh, because of the expansion. Um, he says that it's – fairly routine just you know occasionally run off the, the occasional homeless guy or the like he he said the horny teenagers who think they're going to find a place to park out mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. so he says a lot of it is usually pretty uh you know routine but this night he was sitting there um and he thought he heard something so he got out started looking around um runs into a being seven foot tall being with red eyes with wings and the being just basically looked at him. Um, and he says, like, within, like, a few seconds of that happening, the whole area just lit up. Um, he says, I mean, he could see equipment. He could read labels, everything. And he says he looked up and, you know, it lit up for a few seconds when it was done. He says that um, the um, above him was a large triangular-shaped, you know, object. Mm -hmm. And at first I was asking, you know, could it have been a plane? You know, planes fly overhead. If you look at them from a certain angle, they look like triangular shaped objects, um, especially when they got, you know, their landing lights on or, you know, at, at takeoff. But he said, no, this thing was standing still and it wasn't making noise. A, a plane is flying over. It's making a ton of noise as it's taken off, uh, which I live in the glide path and, you know, takeoff path of uh, O'Hare. Trust me. They can, they can, you know, make a ton of noise as they're flying overhead. Mm -hmm. um, but he says that this thing, you know, slowly started moving away. And he was asking, you know, I was like, give me a kind of a, um, 
kind of give me what you a description of what you mean by slowly moving away. Um, and he says it was moving, but it wasn't moving um, really fast. Like it was taking its time to get out of there. And he says, and it kept rising higher as it got away and eventually just disappeared. Um, but he said that the um, the creature that was he had seen was apparently pretty agitated um, and was, you know, took off into the night. So it's kind of strange. You know, it's a very strange, he said it was, um, it was a very uh, frightening experience for him. He says he went back to his truck and he stayed there, you know, didn't unlock the doors or anything. And, you know, we're talking about an armed security guard mm -hmm. um, that, you know, it scared him. And he says it, you know, eventually he did return back to work at that same site, but he did say that it was a very strange um, encounter. Um, and he had not heard about the moth, you know, the, the Chicago Mothman or any of the sightings at O'Hare mm -hmm. until he had actually gone online and, you know, found, you know, the, the reports and everything. That's when he made his report. Wow. You know, um, this UFO activity at the airport and the association with the unseen ones are these winged beings. And those, apparently through the communications, and this is what I got from, you know, Jennifer and Bernadette, that, and I think Manuel made note of it too, that they seem to be followed by these these UFO and whoever's flying the UFOs around. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is that what you've made out, uh, Manuel? Well, I mean, O'Hare's quite quite a long history when when it comes to UFOs mm -hmm. in and around there. I mean, the most famous one being the the one that's seen over Terminal Three, I believe, that mm -hmm. punched a hole in the uh, in the uh, in the clouds, you know. But there's been, I mean, we've had the one that was seen over the airport. We there have been multiple uh, sightings of like you know cigar shape, egg shape, you know, basically every shape of the you know that you can think of. We've had, you know, entity sightings, you know, gray alien entity sightings at the airport. So kind of makes me think that, um, you know, there's got to be something hand in hand going, you know, on at the airport. You know, we've already more or less established that there's something going on at the airport um, aside from planes. I mean, there's been a lot of military activity there. There's been a lot of strange, you know, happenings at that airport. So mm -hmm. I kind of think that, yeah, it kind of goes hand in hand. I mean, and we've had multiple um, sightings, reports and stuff in the course since this, the, this whole flap began um, in the city of Chicago with UFOs being associated with these sightings as well. What's your take on that, Tobias? Well, now this uh this this lated uh, i'm sorry this this latest uh reported witness now is is this the uh the individual that um i was given the the email contact info for no that was i believe the truck driver yeah oh, okay. that was the one at uh usps sorting this was uh back in uh this one with the security guard was in september oh uh, okay so this was yeah there. and um you know, they're well. They're doing some major overhaul and work over there at the airport. Anyway, I mean, it, was this site part of that, uh, Manuel? Yeah, it's. Uh, I went out there a couple of times, and I've I've also um, passed it. I know where it's at. You got to pass it to go to the cargo facilities mm -hmm. on the on the far north side of the of the airport. But um, it's basically a like a rock crusher kind of facility where they make. Um, I, I think across the street they make like cement, but this one I think they make like asphalt or something like that mm -hmm. uh, as part of the airport. It's just like a mobile on-site um, site, I guess, if you want to say it, but uh, just um, so that they don't have to run back and forth, you know, to wherever they go get uh, the material. They can actually just make the material there on-site. Mm -hmm. um, so they got like this mobile – there's a huge like mobile rock crusher there, a uh, bunch of um, – you know containers and tanks and stuff like that i'm not exactly sure 
what the whole operation is, but I know that they you see a lot of uh, dump trucks, a lot of cement trucks, and a lot of like uh, the short tailed um, um, dump trucks mm-hmm. out there that they use to haul asphalt around. So um, my guess is that this is like a, a facility that was put there as part of the expansion. Um, and uh, it was also by, by that site where they started making the, where they made the new radar station that they put up a couple of years ago that's across the street, basically across the street from from that facility. So, yeah, it's it's basically there just to facilitate the, the expansion of the airport. Mm. Okay. You any, hmm. any, anything to add to that, uh, uh, Tobias? Well, you know, that... That's interesting to me. You know, you you hear a lot about, say, in in cases of uh, you know um, reported hauntings, for instance. Uh, mm-hmm. Anytime there's there's some kind of, of renovation or or building or something going on on in uh, existing structure, it, it it can sort of stir things up, right? Mm-hmm. And so when I hear about somebody having a, a winged humanoid sighting at this sort of like active uh, construction site, that's that's that that's purpose is to help uh, I- expand the the airport. I I can't help but think that uh, there's a possibility those things could be related. Now, you know, uh, Manuel mentioned that the uh, the, the being seemed agitated mm-hmm. to the the, the, the uh, witness. You know, could could there be some sort of connection between uh, uh, winged beings and specific areas that uh, uh, or whereby you know if this specific area was, was being messed with in a certain way, it, uh, it, it would cause them, um, some sort of distress say. Yeah, there could be. I mean, I, I honestly think that, you know, they kind of work hand in hand, um, with it. And I do, you know, I know, like you said, I've, there's been many uh, cases in the, with ghost hunting and stuff, um, and paranormal word, someone's bought the house and they started renovating it and all of a sudden you know basically all hell break, breaks loose because we hear it all the time they're tearing something apart but you know this please remember also that that is not too far away from that part of the airport where they had to tear up the cemetery they mm-hmm. actually had to uh, um elk grove village i believe it was where it was at they had to uh relocate the entire graves out of there and they were fighting for it to keep it there the only reason Rest Haven has not been disturbed is it's kind of tucked out of the way. And number two, I think it's a it's a historical landmark, um, so they're not allowed to touch it. But I remember the big uh, controversy because one of the airport uh, runways was going to be built or expanded out, so it was going to have to move a bunch of uh, of graves that were there. Some of them had been there for you know 150 years, mm-hmm. um, you know. So yeah, I I, I can see that happening. Um, but we've had such a, you know, multitude of sightings in and around, not only just at the airport, but, you know, in, you know, in, uh, Rosemont, you know, you've had sightings of the humanoids, you've had UFO sightings. Uh, we've had the one gentleman who saw the, the winged humanoid come out of the woods, uh, the Uber driver, um, Mm -hmm. that saw it come out of the woods and take off. And he said he, that was the one I remember the most because it, he said it smelled like ammonia. Yeah, um, that was one of the original ones. That was the one that actually got reported to MUFON first, and we mm-hmm. took it over. And what really struck me on that one was, um, I cannot remember the name of the case. Uh, it might be the, I think you might know what I'm talking about, Tobias. Um, it happened in Brazil, where the they had been a, like a UFO sighting the night before. Evan, there was a little village, and they had caught uh, two entities. Mm-hmm. There, the children had seen the entities against the building, and there was like a, a really strong smell of ammonia that mm-hmm. actually sickened a bunch of people. Before the military swooped in and and took care of you know took them out, um, it kind of reminded the, uh, me of the Regna sightings. Is that what it was called? I believe so. I'm gonna have to yeah. look it up real quick. Uh, um, yeah, that's a pretty uh, famous case, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, signing. I sent, um, I'm trying to look it up. Uh, yeah, the Varigna mm-hmm. UFO incident uh, in 1996. Mm-hmm. Um, 
they were talking about how they had a they had a very very strong smell of uh, ammonia that had actually sickened a whole lot of people uh, mm. when these things were caught and uh, they were captured eventually by the Brazilian min- military. So um, that kind of really really just uh, struck me out struck out to me when that sighting was reported that uh, it kind of reminded me of that. Um, and we've had, of course, you know, the gray alien sightings. A couple of truckers had reported they thought it was a child walking along the where the cargo area was. And they were, mm-hmm. afraid, you know, somebody had abandoned a little child around there. And, you know, there's a lot of semis that come flying around that corner. They didn't want them to get hit. And it turns out to be a gray alien. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's really gets me that uh, a lot of these sightings are going hand in hand with uh, UFO sightings there. Hmm. Well, you know, like I said, according uh, to these beings, the, um, they're being chased by these extraterrestrials or beings that are within these these crafts. So, you know, I don't know what the whole relationship is there. I, I don't know if they're just being harassed or chased down or what the deal is, but I, I know they're they're cognizant of it and they know about it and who knows? So anyway, um, well, but, <clears throat> go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I mean, that the, the whole thing is, is so strange and the, the, the threads so uh, sort of Byzantine in their, their construction <laughs> when you try to actually navigate them to, to, to discern what might actually be, be uh, happening. You know, it, it, it reminds me, we had uh, in, in Estes uh, session uh, recently, right? Uh, right here in our, our library, actually. And, um, and, and Emily was being the, the control. So she had the, the you know, the headphones and the, uh, the blinder and, and, and everything on. And um, we had, you know, sort of specifically and, and uh, intentionally uh, uh, attempted to, to contact the the unseen one specifically, you know, using that that specific name, and something certainly seemed to come through, and and I couldn't mm. tell you what it was, but it seemed very very reluctant, sort of to to, to talk to us, um, and uh, you know the 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 message that kept coming through was was no wait uh, uh, later. Um, and uh, and that was just so strange, especially considering uh, some of the the spirit box results that we got out in the uh, the southern unit of the the Kettle Moraine State Forest um, that 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 were much clearer. And, and some of those, just you know, uh, uh, out of my my uh, memory, were things like uh, that we were being watched, being probed, uh, and and we would see these lights out there, and the the, the lights would seemingly follow us and it seemed like those were you know one of one of the the means of of watching us so it it makes me wonder then you know what necessarily we might have actually been in 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 contact like with whom were were we really speaking frankly mm-hmm. um you know so like you say that that you have communicated uh, or, or 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 bernadette has communicated with uh with certain entities claiming to be the, these winged humanoids Mm-hmm. And they're saying that that uh, you know they're running from these the, these UFOs or in conflict with these these UFOs. And on the the, the other hand, uh, something that that we seem to have been in communication with uh, made it sound like uh, what we had actually been talking to uh, could have been you know whatever was behind those UFOs, as opposed to you know any any uh, uh, ultra terrestrial entity or something that. That's that's responsible for uh, for for winged uh, humanoid sightings, and of course that's that's all speculation. Um, right. Uh, that's that's about all I have right now. But um, it it does make me wonder, honestly. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, th- th- we had a question from James about the current status with the unseen ones, and well, that's just it. We're um, we're kind of incommunicado with these things for the most part recently because of uh, Bernadette and, and Jennifer have been sick 
They haven't been feeling well. They kind of shut themselves down because of it. Uh, Manuel said he had a contact with Uru about two days ago. And, of course, you know, back in November, we had an issue where people were trying to communicate with these things. People outside the group were trying to communicate, try to summon these things. And there was at least one case where we understand of someone trying to bind it. And that didn't go over well. Um, I, I, I think we lost some... Um, some trust at that point. I don't know if you want to call it that, but things really seem to slow back. Uh, so I, I think it's a matter of just really reestablishing some contact with these, these things on a more regular basis though, you know, just tonight, like I said earlier that, um, Manuel said that he did have contact with Uru. I have been told that I need to step up my game and try and get in contact. And believe me, I've been trying, uh, but it just hasn't seemed to work out. So um, maybe I'm going to take some, some instruction as well as to how this is going to happen. So sure, you know, we'll just have to wait and see. Well, that, 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 that certainly seems to fall in line with the, the uh, results of the uh, Estes method. Uh, mm -hmm. session that, that, that we had here you know we're really the the most communicated message really out out of that uh, uh experiment was you know you have to wait you have to wait in in until later because we were asking you know just sort of uh some some basic questions um that anybody you know interested in this would 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 want to know like sort of what is your uh interest in in certain areas you know so on and and, and so forth and the, the the message seemed pretty clear um, that uh, that that information just wasn't going to be forthcoming right now, right. and um, you know I, I don't know if there's something uh, that that they were waiting for, or you know I, for all I know they were just messing with me, but uh, yeah. but that, that that was pretty clear. Well, you know I got to go back to the original message we got from them was you'll know more in three years and before five years so it'd be before, after three before five now, i don't know what the hell that's supposed to mean so i i, I guess you know we're going to you know within that time period though that seems like a long time that we're going to you know <laughs> this started 2017 for us as a team so you right. know it's been five years so you know you know but since you know we did contact them back in i think it was back in july uh that's kind of seemed the, the, the starting point so i guess we'll have to wait and see him mm -hmm. so I, mean, I don't know i've thought so, i've given it a lot of thought of different ways to investigate right. and you know tobias brings up the estes method which is a really interesting method um one of i'm gonna have to look into that actually one of the things my son brought up was um because my son is you know pretty much following he loves the uh, paranormal he loves to investigate as well is um the use of um uh, it just slipped my mind i know what it is it's a it looks like a little radio but basically scans the fm dial or the am dial at a very fast pace yeah and spirit box yeah you're basically yeah. picking up messages you're supposed to be like blindfolded and have headphones in but i was thinking like this would be something that I would love to try. Like once the weather turns, you know, and it's not negative 50 yeah, degrees yeah. outside at the, uh, yeah. I, I want to try that at uh rest Haven one mm -hmm. night. Yeah. You no, know. that's, I mean, uh, the, what, what, what you're describing literally is the, 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 uh, Estes method. Like that's, that's, that's what we did. Uh, we have all of the, the, um, equipment for it and, and everything that we need. So yeah, I mean, we're not very far away, you know, it takes us maybe hour, hour and 15, you know, to, to get to O'Hare. So as soon as that, that weather turns, we'd love to meet up and, and, uh, and just see what happens. Oh Good. yeah. I would love to do that because, um, the first time I had actually seen it on TV was, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever watched the series Hellier, uh, talking about yeah. the, uh, Kelly Hopkins, mm -hmm. the gentleman was doing that method. And, uh, 
my son had actually brought that up to us and he was like, yeah, that would work, you know, you, but you'd have to basically go there, you know, again, like when, when I first contacted Uru, it was um, 11 o'clock at night, midnight, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sitting in the air at the cemetery, but um, yeah, that was that a was weird just, night. Yeah, that was an experience that you know that was that was a once in a lifetime experience. But I would love to actually do that as much. As, I know we've talked with the team about like setting up uh, like trail cams and stuff like that. You know, we have I have you know, access to hunting trail cams that are actually good for nighttime visions. Um, that would be great because. That's probably about the only place I can set up without having security tearing them down or, you know, attracting the security that's now seemed to increase so much more at the airport um, since these last few sightings. Mm. Okay. Well, at least have a, we have a possible plan for that. Um, yeah, that, you know, Tobias, that might be a pretty good idea. I mean, you know, you guys meet up and some of the other people i know jen will probably get involved and sure. uh yeah mm -hmm. absolutely yeah, there, there's something to that uh that, that rest haven cemetery too um you know yeah. uh emily and i went down there uh some some time ago it had to be a, a, a couple of months ago now it, it, it was much warmer out and uh mm -hmm. And it's it's an interesting place, you know. It it was so loud that we had brought some of our spirit boxes and, and stuff like that. But with all of the, the the planes taking off and landing and everything, like I, we couldn't hear anything. So right. I, I had brought my my dowsing rods. You know, I've got a set of, of of copper dowsing rods, and so I you know you don't have to hear anything for those. And so I I brought those out, and and gotten some some interesting results in in that you know there were a a, a few hits. You know, I, I was able to ask, um, you know, if if something was there with us and then, um, you know, they, they they did cross in the affirmative for, for that. Um, and then at that point, we we decided, well, hey, let's sit here um, and, and we'll just sort of meditate and see if anything reaches out. But I think that it was honestly so loud that we just couldn't concentrate, like we couldn't get into the, the, the right state of mind to, to allow any kind of contact because, you know, af after that, we just didn't, didn't have um, anything, un unfortunately. But, you know, the, the results were interesting enough with those dowsing rods for me to think, hey, you know, this is probably worth, you know, uh, uh, investigating further. Maybe, uh, and, and maybe uh, uh, Manuel would, would know this at a time that, that is a little quieter because I'm not even exaggerating. We, <laughs> we couldn't hear each other. You know, like yeah. Emily's right next to me and we could not hear what the other person was saying. Yeah, we, I was out there. It was still loud. I mean, you still have planes going, but if you're there in the early evening, I mean. It was it, early evening. Yeah. yeah. You, these planes come in, there, there's like a, it's like a 45 second uh, lapse. And mm -hmm. if you actually see it from a distance, it's, it's, it's so strange. I've, and I've, my wife has pointed it out before. And I was like, these planes are stacked up you know 50 deep and you can just see them coming in um and as soon as one get lands the other one's already on the final approach mm -hmm. so you know as soon as one the the plane that landed is turning off the runway as it's turning the other one's already making contact with the runway and same thing when they're leaving and it is yeah it gets very very loud over there good to yeah. know <laughs> yes well, you know, I, I watch I watch those plane spotter videos on um, YouTube all the time over that era. It's pretty amazing how busy that place really is. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, coming in all directions too. Because I I don't know how many how many um, runways they've got going on at one time. It seems like four or five, maybe six of them. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I believe four in the commercial, and but they also share a. There's also two extra runways that are usually used for the cargo. Right. Um, and the, unfortunately, the thing is with uh, Rest Haven sits right in the midst of the cargo area. Mm -hmm. So you have planes coming by. And it's also not too far away. Uh, Tobias will probably know that the tarmac is basically just on the other side of that big wall. Fence. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. sometimes um, I've been out there before and they're bringing a plane in that's going to the F FedEx facility. And this thing is it's it's being towed into place but 
it still has the engines going and it's loud. I mean, it will get, you know, loud as it's passing by um, where we had that July 22nd incident, you know, mm-hmm. um, I've taken video before there and those planes are just, they're just sitting there getting unloaded, but they're still got the engines idled. So yeah, oh, it yeah. can get pretty loud and pretty noisy. I'm just lucky that well, you see the kind of like hearing uh, uh, protection people wear out there. You know? Oh yeah. Like, it's, it's oh, serious yeah. business. Oh yeah. So one, one other thing I, I, I wanted to say um, about that area before I forget for anybody who's not familiar and, 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 and I'm sure uh, Manuel could, could back me up on this is it is so much more isolated than you expect, you know, because you drive through like the, this maze of streets and it's so easy once you're back into sort of like the cargo areas and stuff. Um, you know, it's not like there are, are just people on top of you, you know, there's, there's big green spaces, um, you know, there it's 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 very easy from my perspective, having you know gone there more than 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 once to look into these sightings to see sort of how they happen and why they tend to happen, where they tend to happen. Because it's definitely the parts of the 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 airport, at least in in, in the most credible sightings, um, where you know, if you were gonna see something like this, those are the places you you would see it because there aren't necessarily like a lot of people there, you know. Um, I didn't see anybody when 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 we were in Rust Haven. Um, and it was relatively early evening, and you know, there's maybe one or two employees walking up to a, 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 a building which was you know hundreds and hundreds of feet from us. Um, but otherwise, you know, you're just driving around in there, and it's like driving around in like in an abandoned city. You might, mm. you know, you might not see anybody. Yeah. And a lot of people, I see a lot of people who go out there, to, you know, who are, um, they want to investigate or they want to just, you know, try to have a sighting. They don't think, they think, oh, it's such, you no, know, they don't see anybody. But trust me, you're you're being seen, you're being watched at all times. Uh, people have found out, um, there's been tons of reports of other investigators, you know, younger investigators who decided to, you know, let me climb this fence. Let me see what's well, on the other side and find out how quickly the security sure. response is and how aggressive the security response is. Um, I was just telling Lon that there's been an uptick from a lot of drivers that I have that not only work for the company I work for, but also work in the industry that have said that they've seen everything now, you know, more helicopters going by more you know security officers and security uh, uh, vehicles and even drones um in the area that have been you know part of the sec- you know uptake of security so they're taking it pretty serious um but yeah you're right i mean when we were out there um i was out there when i had decided with uru and then uh few weeks later with another member of the singular fording society uh who was there um that was um i met up with him and we were out there and it was like about 10 o'clock at night and it, you'd be surprised how quiet it can be you know you can sit there and you can you know concentrate um you know with the occasional plane going by of course but um and the occasional vehicle that are going but most of these facilities even though they're running 24 hours um in the case of like Rest Haven, the FedEx facility is right next, uh, right across the street, but it's hundreds of yards, I know two, three hundred yards away. Um, and it's between you and that is a huge parking lot. So, mm-hmm. you know, unless you're there during a shift change, you know, it's for the most part pretty quiet. You know, you might have the occasional person who comes by to see the cemetery or something, but, you know, you can literally be out there um, by yourself and no one would even bother you hmm. you know what one thing I, I i have noticed uh since we've been getting these settings out by uh, chicago especially at the usps facility and uh uh the um chicago aviate avionics center there it seems like these things show up as shift changes mm-hmm. or when people are getting off work now, yeah. I don't know how true that is, but they do seem to show up a lot around 9, 30, 10 o'clock when people are leaving those places. Uh, I have noticed there is a, a pattern there. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, maybe that's something we need to inquire with them. 
Sure. Um, well, I, I, I think that just makes a certain amount of sense, right? Because um, there aren't there, there aren't going to be any sighting reports if if there's nobody there to, to see. Absolutely. Anything, right? yeah. And when else is anybody going to be outside? Is probably during shift change or if they're having a smoke break or they're waiting for their truck to be loaded or, or something similar. And, and yeah, absolutely. That's, that's when you see these sightings happen, you know, mm -hmm. uh, is, is during those, those rare periods when in, employees tend to be outside. I mean, uh, the, the first report, I actually, the only uh, report that I've taken directly from O'Hare was from a guy who uh, worked for, for one of the, the cargo companies and, uh, and he had just left work. You know, and, and he happened to, to, to be driving. Um, I can't remember the, the the name of the street, but it's it's sort of by this huge open field with like a, a, a tall barbed wire fence in front of it. And, uh, and and that's where he saw this this creature. But of course, he wouldn't have been able to see it if he was still at work. It was only when yeah. he was leaving, you know, that that he, he happened to, to, to run into it. Yeah, we had the one lady who worked for the uh, Chicago uh, Aviation Department who had that... Uh... Who had that um, sighting, and she was, but she had stayed late to do some work, and she was um, mm -hmm. talking about how she went outside, and this thing seemed to like it was, like she described it, it was stalking her. Um, the only reason it left it was because a semi had come from the cargo area, turned from the cargo area down that street. Uh, but even as as she ran for the car, she could still hear it screeching and, you know, making that clicking sound that she said it it was making. So it was really strange. I and mean, of course, you have the USPS where the, the one lady um, illuminated it with her headlights and it came right at her. Um, that was, you know, just that was at, at the same time at a shift change. You know, she had just gotten off of work. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really strange that, you know, they, it's almost like they want to be seen, uh, but at the same time don't want to be seen. Well, that was um, one of the, the things that, that we had asked during that, that Estes method session, um, you know, it was if there was something purposeful, you know, behind these, these sightings. Um, and again, they, it didn't seem like they wanted to talk about it. Wow. Well, hopefully we're going to be able to connect again somehow. Um, yeah. You know, we'll see. Anyway, the uh, after that sighting of the uh, the large boomerang UFO by the security guard, we had another reported sighting from a couple years ago in Cicero from a family who was coming home from a fireworks display and saw this thing up in a tree out in front of the house. Uh, the whole family saw it. I think it was uh, a gentleman, his wife, and two daughters. They all saw the thing described a very similar to what people have been seeing with the red eyes and the same body, uh, dark body and the, and the bat like wings. Then we had a, uh, another older sighting from, um, out the gold coast area down, down the city, uh, of something flying around up there, which was described as the same thing a bat wing being, uh, then we got this sighting of the um, the gargoyle that was encountered several times by several different people over there at Stillman Valley, Illinois. Um, that's an interesting one because this is a report that of people who have deaf, different people, and of course that's near that's near Rockford, and of course we've had a lot of sightings around in and around Rockford we've had three or four sightings around there. Plus this one. Uh, unfortunately we haven't had anybody go out there and look at the specific location. That's in, um, Google County, Ogle County. And, mm -hmm. uh, it's off of route 72. There's a truck company called Glen Denning brothers trucking right off, uh, right off the inner i mean right off the the uh, highway right there where these sightings have taken place so i don't know yeah we're gonna have to get somebody out there at some point yeah i'm, I'm uh, just looking at that location right now i'm sure it's not that far from us yeah you know, it's not it's um, just uh it's just south of you guys 
So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We're only, uh, that, uh, now, that was only... 2015, but yeah. Right. So we'll, we'll yeah, some of those rock for sightings were, were, were very interesting. Like there was the one um, where I had spoken to this witness, Jonathan, directly. He actually ended up being in the, the small town monsters, you know, doc uh, mm -hmm. uh, on the trail of the uh, Lake Michigan Mothman then. Um, and uh, his sighting was was very interesting, you know, where he basically was was walking his, his mother out to her car because she was, I, I believe, a nurse and she was going to go to work. And so one thing he did, which was, is, was very sweet was he would walk his mom out to her car. <clears throat> Excuse me. He would, he would walk his mom out to her, her car. And, um, and he saw this thing in, in, uh, in the tree or in a tree near, near their home. And it, you know, it sort of, uh, had the, 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 I hate to say stereotypical, but, uh, but, but relatively common, I guess, uh, a mothman appearance of this huge, you know, seemingly winged, black being with these piercing red eyes and gave off this screech. And of course he was terrified, but what's, what's even more interesting about this particular sighting is uh, sometime later, he, uh, he and a, a friend of his actually had a UFO sighting in, in literally the uh, exact same spot, basically, mm. which is the same thing that we saw out of, of uh, Paula in, uh, I believe it was uh, Wakanda. Uh, which is a, a, a little town uh, sort of mm -hmm. on the outskirts of, of, of Chicago. And uh, she had a very similar sighting where actually she had, hers was kind of in, in reverse order where she saw this uh, anomalous beam of light come down out of the, the, the sky one night and, uh, and sort of, you know, uh, it shone down and uh, it sort of illuminated this, this relatively small patch in this yard of, of, across from, you know, where she lived and um, and of course she's terrified by by this we, because interestingly it almost seemed to respond to her observation. So she sees this thing, and it like uh, sort of retracts back up, right? So it, like it, it it comes down. It's like a spotlight, but it's not shedding light like a, a, a spotlight. It almost seemed like a, a a kind of solid light, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. and so this thing comes down. And then it like retracts up into the sky and then it comes down again. And she's like, Oh God, it, it must have seen me, you know? So she like dives for cover and then it just ends up, you know, uh, uh, retracting one, one final time and leaving. But then uh, sometime later, I was, I, I think two, three years to the day, actually uh, she was outside doing something totally normal. Uh, just like taking her garbage out. And uh, and she sees this thing, this creature in the exact same spot where that that light was. And it seemed to be approaching her. But when it moved, it, it, it didn't move like, you know, you or I would move. It wasn't, you know, sort of walking towards her. Uh, she described it as looking like somebody moving through a, a strobe light. So it just seemed to make these quick sort of jumps, you know, towards her, not like literally mm -hmm. jumping, but just like disappearing and then reappearing very quickly, you know, moving progressively towards her. And, uh, and she's terrified naturally. And so she fumbles for her keys to get the door open and she's sure this thing has to be right behind, like right behind her. And, um, and when she, uh, she finally gets the, the, the lock open and, and, and opens the door and turns around, like the, the thing is just gone. Um, and so, you know, you get some of these these sightings where it's not just that people are seeing, you know, uh, a, a, a UFO in in the, the, the same area or, or you know, somebody's uh, having an, an unrelated UFO sighting, you mm -hmm. know, uh, similar to the, the, the sighting that Manuel talked about earlier. It's it's just so puzzling to me to have these witnesses. Um, you know, very seemingly credible people. You know, uh, these two specifically are people that that I had spoken to over the phone. I have met in person. Uh, they were willing to go on the record, go on camera. Um, and I'm going to tell you, they're not getting anything for it other than whatever peace of mind comes from, you know, having people help them uh, in, in investigate their their personal experiences. You know, it's it's not like they're they're getting paid or anything. Right. So. Mm -hmm. um it's just really, really, really interesting to me. And I think that like whatever we can do to try to understand why, you know, why, why that might be happening might get us uh, a whole heck of a lot closer to understand uh, why any of this is, is, is happening, honestly, because they do seem so related in, in so many ways. 
Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, it's just like everything else. You, you know, when in, investigating the paranormal and cryptids and such, there always seems to be a caveat there where there's another phenomenon associated with it. And that may very be, be very well be what's going on here. You know, we get, do get occasional UFOs and occasional other humanoids or possible extraterrestrials involved with these ultra-terrestrial sightings. Um, you know, maybe we'll, we'll be able to get to work this out with them and get some more information. But, you know, from the very beginning, we've been looking at this as far as being connected with other phenomena. And sometimes you think it does, but, you know, sometimes, you know, you just get something else. So, um, uh, Vince, we are... Uh, James has asked, you thought that the UFOs and other entities are using the same portals. You know, I, I have thought for, for a long time that UFOs actually do travel through portals, uh, as opposed to interstellar travel for the most part, you know, I, I, I think, I, I think there's a possibility there. What do you guys think? Well, I mean, could that be their connection to specific areas, for instance? Um, right. right. You know, were if if there were, just to say for the the sake of of argument, uh, certain areas that um, you know were uh, more prone or 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 I guess receptive to uh, something like interdimensional you know travel or or travel between parallel universes or something like that then yeah I mean I would imagine that uh, that that all entities that sort of exist in those spaces would uh, would would make use of of the the, the same you know uh, egress to to travel between those the, like those 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 uh, spaces so sure mm-hmm. yeah. We, and we I think that, you know, think about the whole area. I mean, um, from where, let's just say from where Chicago's at, I mean, you put a kind of a 200 mile radius or so, 150 mile, 200 mile radius. Think about how much has gone on in that, that little area. I mean, you have um, so many UFO sightings, so many um, disappearances, um, so many like, crypto sightings i mean everything from mothman to you know pterosaurs rocks uh or not rocks but uh thunderbirds sightings uh mm-hmm. native american um not too far from like where tobias and i live is uh bray road you know you have uh dogman sightings you have the kettle moraine where in just about anything and everything can be seen at the kettle moraine so mm-hmm. um they're all within a certain area um and the history, not just within the last like 20, 30 years, but some of this stuff has been going on for hundreds of years. I mean, um, you know, you got to kind of think that there's got to be something with the area alone. You know, maybe it's the lake. Maybe it's, you know, the convergence of ley lines or something, um, you know, that have that cause all this stuff to happen. I mean, so much high straightness, you know, happens. Um all the stuff that's in the air, uh, let's just say from the airport, uh, aside from the airport, think of how many strange haunted places or where there's been high strangeness in the Chicago area. You have multiple cemeteries that are considered haunted. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you have one where um, there's a there's a cemetery where you can see um, a um, hitchhiker that you see uh, that people see all the time there's uh there's an actual place um it's a very old dilapidated um cemetery i believe it's called it's called Batchers grove mm-hmm. um it's considered to be one of the most haunted places uh, you know on the planet and some of these some of the people that i know that are like pagans and stuff like that have said they've gone there and have just been overwhelmed mm-hmm. by how much energy is going there um so many different places you know the the um there is a a nightclub in chicago called the they used to be called the excalibur they used to be a morgue for uh the chicago fire and when the there's a um a orphanage to burn down they used it as a morgue uh the alley where the uh 
where the uh, St. Valentine's Day Massacre, you know, still considered mm-hmm. very haunted. Um, so many things from UFOs to USOs been seen coming in and out of the lake. Uh, there's um, not too far from on, um, on the lake, a place called the Lake Michigan Triangle, mm-hmm. where they've had so many things happen. You know, all this stuff happening here um, is just... Two, and it's all happening within like a 200 mile radius. I mean, you can get on your car and go to most of these places within a couple of hours. Um, you know, so many things happening, strange things happening because of this. And I think a lot of it has to do with like portals or, you know, maybe, you know, Native American uh, sightings like Kettle Moraine. I can only imagine if that place is probably. M- you know, tied somehow to the First Nation tribes that were there. You know, you have so many tribes in that area, like the Oneida uh, people that are there. Uh, How many of that stuff could possibly be, you know, explained because, you know, of Native American uh, shamanism or something? Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the portals that they are used, they are using the same portals or a combination of portals just to get in and out of the area. But, I mean, so much stuff is concentrated within this little area. That's just, it's not, you can't ignore it, you know. Sure. No, I mean, I, I most, well, all of Wisconsin, of course, uh, belong to, to, to various uh, in, indigenous peoples, you know, prior to, to European settlement. Um, I, I don't know how much of it is is related to them directly. Uh, I, I, I do know um, from, you know, of, of a few of, of my friends that, that happen, you know, to, to be Native American that, you know, certainly um, they grew up hearing stories of, of, about strange things. Um, and so that was very much or, or is very much a, a, a part of, of, of their specific culture, at, at least. Um, to speak to that point about geographic areas, too. Now, this was interesting, and, and I don't think I've, I've uh, had a chance to, to tell you guys about this. So, Remember back, uh, this was Thanksgiving of 2020, uh, two young women in Oregon, Wisconsin, said that they were out driving and they saw this, this winged humanoid. And so when, when Emily and I uh, went to go check it out, now these two witnesses had said that they had had some kind of weird interference with their radio. And so, you know, naturally, that's something we were looking for when we went to go uh, investigate this sighting area. Now, nothing happened to our car radio, but when we got home, all of our recording devices all had the same weird uh, audio interference. It was this weird, like, crackling mm. sort of popping, and, and it there was no explanation for it. And so, um, you know, we, we, we went back maybe a, a, a week or two later. Um, because the, the the first time we had gone, uh, of of course, was as as quickly as as we could. So it was maybe uh, a, a week or so after the actual sighting, because they had only contacted us, you know, a, a, a couple days before that. And so, you know, we went back again, and uh, you know, it was maybe a, a a week or two later, and and the same audio interference happened, but it was much quieter. And then uh, this past Thanksgiving, we, we decided, because we were home anyway, that, uh, well, hey, what the hell, why not on the one year anniversary of this sighting, let's go back to this area. We'll bring the, the same stuff and we'll see if it happens you know, uh, uh, again. And this time, dead quiet, no audio interference whatsoever. So we went from uh, a, a relatively uh, like recent uh, visit where it was very, very loud, uh, recent to the, the, the sighting, not to right now, um, Mm -hmm. where it was very, very loud to it getting progressively quieter until one year later, it's completely gone. And the only thing I, I, I could think of, or at least where my, uh, uh, imagination took me thinking about this was some sort of door closing in in that area and and whatever it 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 was whatever this this door was that allowed this thing to come through it uh whatever it was made of um reacted with our equipment in such a way as to uh interfere with its 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 audio you know like if mm-hmm. there was some some uh, uh electromagnetic uh frequency being created by this phenomenon that that messed with our 
equipment and this thing was only able to come through or you know be be seen or whatever um while it it it, it was active well there hasn't been a, a, a sighting since and if this door closed of course there 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 wouldn't be well you know it's interesting because you mentioned to me when i posted this thing the other night about the um the sighting out there by the quarries over in um uh what's the name thornton thornton illinois yeah illinois and uh this thing was seen hovering or gliding above the quarry out there the quarries out there because it's places humongous and the guy had mentioned having radio interference as he was driving and noticing it then happened to notice this thing above him or above the quarry so you know, and that apparently other people had stopped on the highway as well to look at this thing. Uh, apparently, there was some type of um, other supernatural aspect to this being where it had like this silvering, silvery like glow around it. And, you know, I've heard that before with other phenomena, you know, especially with the upright canine. We've heard that with people saying that they sent some type of silvery aura or sheen around this being so i don't know i mean maybe that's something to do with the, these these winged humanoids as well so um yeah who knows i mean is this some type of electrical or magnetic interference very well could be could i be guess very easily yeah yeah well, you, you, you see that kind or those kinds of phenomena uh, present in uh, UFO sightings often. People will talk about, uh, you know, their, their car just shutting off or the, the, the radio malfunctioning. And so if we're talking about something, um, say, like the, the use of, of portals for, for uh, just the, the, the sake of speculation in, in, in this argument, you know, if we're talking about something like portals used by multiple types of entities, uh, mm -hmm. it would make sense to have these common phenomena across these uh, seemingly disparate encounters. So if a winch humanoid and a dog man and uh, a, a UFO are all using the, the, the same means to, to gain entrance to our universe, and whatever that is uh, creates this sort of like electromagnetic uh, uh, effect that mm -hmm. uh, interferes with electronics, then we should be seeing it uh, in coordination with all kinds of sightings. And the weird thing is we are. Yeah. And, you know, I, I guess not everybody picks up on it, but maybe there are some of these sightings that, that, you know, maybe they haven't mentioned it or whatever, but I believe that there very well could be. You know, sure. it's interesting. We we did get a question about the um, uh, from James about the uh, possibility of other phenomena uses the same portals to come in and out of as the ultraterrestrials, you know, far from the same dimension and such. And you know, I, I believe it does. You know, this is one thing that we did get from the unseen ones was that there are other wing beings on their dimension as well as. Bigfoot like creatures, which they call Saba, and uh, and upright canines, and I whatever else may be there as well. So, are these other beings ultra terrestrials? Very well could be. You know, we've been talking about this interdimensional theory as far as other cryptids for a long time now. <clears throat> are they coming through on the same the same portal, same wavelength, or whatever? Mm -hmm. I, yeah i'm go ahead oh, go ahead oh okay. I, I i was just gonna say that i mean that was something that uh you know i was speculating about in my uh my, my lake michigan mothman book you know it's sort of mm -hmm. the idea that there is this whole ecology of, of beings right that sort of exists you know uh, either on the level of consciousness or that seems to interact with us uh in 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 some way directly through consciousness and, um, you know, if that's the case, then what does that what does that mean for us? Like, for instance, if you believe in the the persistence of, of human consciousness after death, right, 
um, would you then be able to interact with these other beings directly? You know, I, it's it's just something that that I I spend probably a weird amount of time thinking about. But mm. um, you know, it's definitely something that that has occurred to me as a, a, a possibility. You know, considering everything that that these phenomena have in common. Well, the most recent encounter that we have had out the airport was back in uh, late December, which, of course, were the three hair-winged humanoids that these witnesses apparently had recorded on their phones. And then the witnesses were approached by TSA and their own, um, it was American Airlines, their own... Uh, management and were threatened with termination if they disclosed this uh so you know manuel you you uh you took this report why don't you go ahead and give us the synopsis and everything that happened there i glad to um well basically these um these three maintenance workers were uh working on an airplane uh, they were trying to bring it into uh, the hangar. There's um, on the northern end of uh, the airport, on the right, on the left side of the airport, there's um, three massive hangars from American Airlines, and they use them to uh, do maintenance on the airplanes that come through. Um, they were trying to tow a uh, jet into the airport, into the uh, off the tarmac and into the building. And as they were hooking up, they have like a, the way he had talked about it, it was a tug um, that um, hooked up to this uh, airport, to this uh, plane. And then they would use the tug to, you know, tow the airplane in. As they were trying to hook up to it, somebody yelled out that, you know, hey, look at what's over there. They turned to see three creatures sitting there, you know, looking straight at them. Um, they described them as, you know. I'm trying to actually pull it up right now. Um, yeah, they were seven foot tall, and they were just staring right at them. They were completely black with wings. Um, they had uh, the glowing eyes. And um, within a few seconds of that happening, a security guard, um, you know, pulls up. These guys had started recording all this they had pulled out their phones and stuff and uh seconds later security vehicle comes screaming up with the driveway and stops and some um he described as a white chubby security person runs out with his flashlights and starts checking the area um he's shortly joined by three other trucks and a couple of other supervisors that he recognized from the staff meetings um i look over and you know they're he's looking over at his co-workers they're also recording this and that's when they're told you know to put that away and get back to work um that uh you know she would be they would be reported to their supervisors um the area where these things were must have been about he said that there were at least four different cameras in that area you know security cameras so what gets me is that you know if there were this thing these things were obviously seen um you know, on camera, but mm -hmm. shortly thereafter, they were called into a meeting in the break room. They were just told, go report to the break room. Do not talk to anybody. Um, they went in there and that's when they were, you know, confronted with, you know, supervisors and, you know, security personnel. And they were basically given an ultimatum, lose your, you know, delete the videos in front of us or lose your job. Um, they did ask for their, you know, their union reps, their union represented employees. So they, you know, Obviously, right. you know, requested for their union reps to be there, and they were told this is beyond the union. Um, you know, you have a choice. You know, either do this or, you know, lose your job. And um, all of them complied. They were basically bullied into, you know, showing them that hey, you know, they had deleted the videos in front of them, um, and they were told, you know, that they, you know, if you talk to anybody or this gets out, you know, you will lose your jobs. Um, he did bring up an interesting point, though. He did state that um, many of the people that were involved in that July 22nd sighting, where it was seen, they were the, the being was seen being surrounded by security by multiple employees. 
most of those employees had either been um, let go, terminated, or had been reassigned. Um, so they were being basically, you know, made examples. He says that they were being made examples to other employees that do not, you know, do not be reporting this, do not talk to people. Um, you know, this gentleman, he came, he came forward. He, you know, he was brave enough to come forward and say this, but what got me was, um, he was, he, is that they had the video. If, if this video was as close as they said it was, this should have been, you know, clear as daylight, you know, mm -hmm. sitting there. And to think that if there are security cameras in the area, this has to have been, you know, picked up at least a couple of times on cameras. But, you know, good luck trying to get some of that, you know, footage. Um, yeah, we can put as many FOIA requests as we want to, and that, that's just going to hit a dead end. I, I yeah. guarantee you that. Yeah, I mean, he was talking about uh, the gentleman that when I spoke with him, you know, he did state, you know, the area that they were at was they were by a chaining fence that separated the tarmac from the from the parking lots. Mm -hmm. um, so he says that when they showed up, they showed up within seconds of these, you know, beings and these beings like they took off. Um, they, you know, they skedaddled out of that area as quickly as possible. Um, and that... Um, they were just like within seconds, there were security personnel all over the place. So, I mean, obviously, they must be being seen on camera or something for these uh, people to show up. But, I mean, when he talked about the people that were in that office, he said they were, you know, American Airlines executives. And, you know, that they were told, basically, you know, the union can't do anything for you. Um, you have, a, you know, a choice, either, you know, show us that you delete this or delete it in front of us or, you know, lose your job. And when they did approach the union about it, they were told that the union, you know, would look into the incident and get back to them, but they've never heard back, um, you know, from this. So it kind of thinks that, you know, they're starting to get into some strong arm tactics to try to, you know, more or less bully um, these people into uh, trying to keep them from talking. Mm -hmm. Well, See, this is what I was told to. I mean, my contact at one of the uh, one of the commercial carriers uh, was telling me that the security is being stepped up, and uh, there have been people who have lost their jobs, uh, who have been put on notice. Uh, I did ask them about the union involvement. She says she knows of no grievances because she never received or they never received anything. Uh, if grievances were filed or if they were presented to, to specific companies, I don't know. I did get a hold of the, the union you mentioned to me, and I'm not going to mention them on here. And, uh, someone did get back to me and said that they were aware of this incident, but of course they couldn't comment on it, which, you know, me being an ex union official, I understand that it's, you know, it's confidential. So I don't know where that's at, what point that is, but they were aware of it. Uh, but that's all they tell me. The fact you know, it's one thing about the if they did get video, it's a damn shame they didn't upload it on the cloud somewhere before this thing got uh, deleted. That's a shame. But uh, anyway, I can understand where they were, were freaked out and, and surprised and shocked by the response they got. But you are right. They are stepping up things. And... Um, I, I, I've also been, you know, I, I've also been told that it's it's going on in the terminals as well, that, you know, there's a lot of talk among people who are working not only on the tarmac or in the maintenance areas or in the cargo areas, it's going on in the carrier areas, in the passenger areas as well. So uh, who knows? Who knows? I mean... I mean, how much more of this is going to, how, how is this going to progress? 
I mean, why are they doing this? You know, the only thing I can think of, of, of why is a commercial reason or a, a monetary reason. Of course, you know, the COVID thing put a, put a crimp on the, um, on the airline industry. They lost a lot of money. Maybe then coming out of that and then people having to worry about these beings showing up and maybe causing an airline accident, like one of them get sucked up in the engine or something. Maybe that's what they're considering. I don't know. But it does the the strong arm arm tactics is is a little strange to me. Uh, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that, Tobias? Well, I you know, this is something that, that I, I personally struggle with um, because we're talking about something that has a real world effect on, on actual people's lives. And, and if that's the case, you know, uh, assuming all of these stories are, are, are true, which mm -hmm. at this point it is an assumption, you know, um, I, I can't offer up anybody evidence to persuade them if, if, if they don't believe them. And, and I don't, I don't blame them. And so you, I would hope if people are actually being fired over this, you know, that once they no longer have something to lose, you've already been fired. You know, yeah. like what else are they going to do? Why not just come forward and say, hey, this is BS. I was fired because I saw this this weird thing that to me is the 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 missing piece here you know like assuming again assuming all of this is is true and and the airport is is really cracking down on these sightings if you're currently employed i understand being very very cautious like that makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. but once you've been fired screw it like why aren't they on here right now you know like I, if any of them are watching please and get I, a hold I, of them you, i, you I well. agree with you i agree with you but the, you know i and i thought of that myself but as again I, I have done grievance arbitrations in the past. And um, if this was, and I was trying to put myself in their shoes. If I was to present this a grievance or, you know, in front of an arbiter, the first thing I would be telling these folks is don't tell anybody about this because this is going to go. If you do start trouble, now I'm not not that I'd want them to do that now. This is the thinking of a union representative. If if you don't want this to go uh beyond the union and the employee and going into an at will uh violation where they could be fired at will for for uh uh for actually doing something detrimental to the company then then by talking about it they may very well get on that level to where the union can help them out True. and that i do well, understand well, if they've been fired then why would it matter right well you know you know these arbitrations when somebody gets fired the arbitrations can take up to a year after the the actual termination and if they're trying to get their job back through an arbitration, you know, if they go in there in front of an arbiter and when they're under question by the attorneys for the company and they ask them, look, did you disclose this to anybody else? And they say they do. That might be the ball game there. Okay. Um, I, that, I'm that just looking, I'm just sense. looking at it. Yeah. I'm just looking at it as a, as a, you know, as a, a staff rep, representing a uh, case for the union hmm. for the employee and look well, i've been through a lot a, of those a matter of time then we just have to wait well you know, we'll once see has exhausted arbitration and everything yeah at a certain point they got nothing to lose well absolutely and i agree with you and you know i would love for them to come forward and i i'm hoping that others will but if there's a union involved, I, and I know how it is. I mean, I know how you work with that. I mean, they're going to tell them, you know, I know you want to tell somebody. I know you want to go out and do this and this and this since you're fired. But if you want to get your job back with back pay, uh, I suggest you shut your mouth. Uh, so you let us do the work 
can try to get your job back with any other without any other incident involved. And that might be the case. So I don't know. I, you know, you know, I'm trying to get more information from these union people, but they're not going to say much. Uh, sure. um, you know, I don't know how strong union representation is for these airline workers. Um, uh, of course, this would be a maintenance, uh, or on ground union represent a union, local union or, or international union. So, uh, I don't know how strong it is. You know, unions have taken a real hit over the years. And uh, it, it's not like it used to be. But um, that's the only thing I can think of. So, But, no, I sure. hope people do come forward. But they have been cracking down. There's no doubt about it. And if this, if this is what they did, if, if they did take a video and they were forced on – condition of them losing their job to remove the video well i can understand why they did it and uh but the fact like manuel said this guy came forward i gotta give him a lot of credit i really do uh, I'm, I'm just hoping others will do that now i don't you know well, we have we have not been getting a lot of reports as of late so maybe there's there's something to that maybe that is a detriment and why we're not getting reports i don't know well i mean also kind of think about it this way i mean um like my job my former jobs before um you know i work in dispatching so mm -hmm. um sometimes i have to sign what are called non-disclosure agreements mm -hmm. that are enforced for like three to four years mm -hmm. after i've terminated with the company so exactly. i can't just go and say hey well we did it this way at this job we know because then, you know, I can get turned around and get sued for, you know, disclosing anything. Um, I mean, maybe this is what they're forcing them to do. You know, you, okay, you know, as part of their employment, you know, you have to, you have to, uh, you know, uh, you know, keep your mouth shut. Or they could even say, you know, if you record anything on your phone, uh, you know, if it's on our property, it's ours, you know. Mm -hmm you know, we can turn around and sue you for it. Um, that too, right. You know, there's any number of things. I mean, I, I would love to have some of these guys come forward, you know, and and go on the record to, and say, hey, this is what's happening. Trust me, it would be wonderful. I would, you know, you know, I'd want to, you know, do a full production of it, non-video or any, everything. But at the same time, like you said, if they are still going through an arbitration process, you know, you know, these are jobs that are, are kind of, you know, they pay very good money. I mean, mm -hmm. these are jobs that are, you know, I know we have, we're kind of in the middle of what they're calling the great resignation, but these are jobs that you don't want to really lose. You know, these are well paying, very well paying, very well benefited unionized jobs. And uh, some of these, this, some of these places, you know, some of these, uh, witnesses you know they they worked their way up um from them i mean i believe the person that was i'm actually just checking it out he ha was eight years he was an eight-year maintenance employee so i mean to be aircraft maintenance is very very specialized yeah and, he's got seniority and, and tenure and you know he's probably making top dollar now yeah and then the thing is i mean it's not just like uh he's gonna say oh I'm, it's not kind of like it can't, I'm just going to compare, you know, apples to oranges, but it can't be like, hey, I'm going to quit McDonald's. I'm going to go work at Wendy's, you know. Mm -hmm. There can only be, an aircraft maintenance person can only work, you know, on aircraft. And, you know, well, you know, airlines talk to each other, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, so maybe he's, that could be one reason. But trust me, I would love to have that happen because I mean, that sure. would crack the, the place wide, wide open. But. I mean, short of somebody finally going rogue and releasing video, you know, sneaking video out and, and releasing it, you know, to it. But I don't see that happening with the, with, you know, their system. I'm pretty sure their security system is all database uh, oriented. So it all goes to one central spot. So no one's going to get a lot of this, you know. It, I would love to have been at that kind of range. You you were probably seeing all sorts of detail. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, at that kind of range that these people were at. 
Mm. Well, you know, I, I, we can only hope that people will come forward despite all the, these restrictions now. Um, you know, another thing I was thinking about was people who do work on these maintenance jobs on carriers or on airlines. Uh, many of them have options down the road where they can be, take company jobs. And, of course, they don't want that on the record. So maybe that's uh, maybe that's a consideration. Well, there's a lot of politics. I mean, you know, we all know how it is when you work. I mean, any job you have, you're, you're going to run into politics. And um, exactly. Yeah. And I can also see kind of where, you know, you don't want to run off your customers. Of course, you don't want to have you know, floods of people showing up at the airport, you know, it become a tourist trap of some kind, you know, if everybody <laughs> wants to, this becomes the next Loch Ness, everyone's lining yeah. the airport around there and, uh, um, you know, or like when this first started, we had all these investigators, these little, um, you know, you know, husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend teams going up there and a lot of them were getting in trouble because they weren't respecting, you know, we have, we follow a certain code. We follow certain ethics. Some people don't have that ethic. You know, there are some places um, uh, right there where this uh, incident happened. If you just go up that road, the that road terminates at a security checkpoint. And uh, mm -hmm. beyond that checkpoint is the USPS facility. Um, that place is not, they're, they're not playing games when it comes to airport security. You drive over that thing without being, without checking in, you're going to be, confronted by airport security and you know you're going to get to find out what the inside of a detention cell looks like um right but you know but you know this is something else you this. mentioned uh, you mentioned before the show to me uh, that your drivers are seeing more drones out there i wonder if they're i wonder if tsa and security are using drones out there they have before i mean i wouldn't think that uh, i would think that there may be you know very small corridor probably using them because i mean obviously yeah. you know these aren't they, they are flight, these aren't so, yeah. yeah they're not going to be using like drones that i order off of amazon or something you know these things right. are probably professionally designed you know but honestly i could think that if one of those actually ever got sucked up into the engine of an airplane that thing would bring the plane down um or at least damage that that uh engine in the process that mm -hmm. could cause a big accident so but at the same time, the cargo areas are so immense over there. I mean, people just don't seem to realize there are at least five different cargo areas just on the perimeter of the airport. And there's more across the street from the airport. These, these places work 24 hours a day. Uh, you know, I have I've worked for multiple companies that have worked there. And, you know, it's not unusual to have drivers out there at midnight two o'clock in the morning picking up loads um you know so yeah i mean it's they're probably working it you know as a security in, in, in a way to secure you know in security because i know that they've talked about um people tell me that you know they are actually going out there and making sure that you're there for you know certain uh you know for what you say you are, they're going to ask for your paperwork. They're going to ask for the manifest or something, you know, they're going to know, want to know why you're out there. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just uh, that airport. It's not just, you know, semi trucks, you know, there are straight trucks, you know, cargo vans, sprinter vans, you know, all sorts of, of ways to, to transport this material. They're going to have to keep an, uh, an eye on everybody. And at the same time, I'm, you know, I'm sure with all these incidents, they trying to keep everybody like us out, you know. Um, the last time, like when I was went out there the last time, you know, I was actually broadcasting to the team and it took all of about five minutes before security showed up. Mm -hmm. um, and they were right there just, you know, they were they weren't interfering, but they they knew I was there. You know, they were watching, you know, what we were doing the whole time we were there. I am quite sure they have our photographs among them be honest with you <laughs> i really do uh, i mean i think um i i, I you know I, I think they have looked at us as well i know like, oh, they have i mean i've had people tell me that they've mentioned fans and monsters 14 research and 
singular 14 ufo clearing out they've mentioned all that that's all been talked about so um yeah they are watching and they have stepped up uh you got any uh final thoughts tobias um you know well honestly i i just wanted to say um how many good points you guys just had like you really crammed a lot of really solid points into the 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 uh, uh, O'Hare Mothman uh, narrative there that I think a lot of people hadn't uh, considered, you know, because people right. ask me and, uh, and, and I, I'm always honest with, with, with folks. So I say, well, here's what we know. Here's, here's what we don't know. Here's what I personally don't know. And so I mm -hmm. think you guys really talking about your personal uh, experience working in these industries to give people some insight into uh, you know the the actual sort of behind the scenes politics and all of the different like mechanisms at play. I think that's really really helpful because I think that's something that people need to hear to understand maybe why things are unfolding the way that they are because it can be very frustrating for people I think to not have all of the information that that they want about this, but there might be very very good reasons. So you know, uh, well done. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we could get to that. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's always a lot of layers when you get involved with this. And then of course, uh, when you're talking jobs unions and what's involved with it and, and all that, um, yeah, I can understand why, why these employees are, uh, we're scared about it. And, um, uh, Thank God we have had a few come forward. So it's hopeful that that's going to continue on. If you yeah, don't mind me interjecting something no. real quick. Um, I was recently asked by somebody about that and um, about these things at O'Hare. And they were saying, like, well, could it be like the <clears throat> the Chicago version of what's happening in L.A. with this jetpack man? Um, and I'm like, first off, um, whoever, if if jetpack man's ever found that jetpack man's going to federal prison mm -hmm. for buzzing you know commercial airlines with his jetpack you know <laughs> um because that is dangerous you know you're gonna bring a plane down one day um and kill a lot of innocent people but i don't honestly see that happening here i mean it's not like this this guy is being seen you know there's i mean video of it of course you know but you're seeing people are seeing this and you know, commercial airline pilots are actually calling into the towers like we just got buzzed by a guy with a jetpack um so i mean that's honestly yeah i mean when i first heard it i mean i'm thinking like you know tony you know tony stark level kind of shenanigans here but <laughs> i mean i don't really see that i mean i see this you know whoever did this honestly great yeah you have you've made a significant step forward if you're actually doing this but it honestly, as busy as O'Hare, or LA is a LAX is a huge airport, but mm -hmm. you got to remember that O'Hare is bigger than than that, and it's mm -hmm. actually I think the it is the fastest or the or or the busiest or the second busiest airport, I believe. Uh, yeah, Atlanta, behind Hartfield, Atlanta, I think it's, it's the second busiest. Yeah, and a lot of it has to do with you know not only just commercial but cargo. Um, I don't think that it would fly here in Chicago. You know, they're so strict with their gear, you know, the air uh, space around here. It kind of goes with the same thing that when we had the, the incidences in uh, in Chicago itself, you know, along the lakefront, people were saying, mm -hmm. oh, it could be somebody in a squirrel suit. No, that's suicide. And you would go to jail for something like that. I mean, it's not a... Uh, it just cannot be, you know, something I don't see as something that could happen in Chicago as much as LAX because the airport is twice the size of LAX and it's busier than LAX. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see where it could actually get away. Someone could actually get away with doing something like this. You know, someone would know something and someone would probably eventually talk about it. Oh, yeah. I mean, from all indications I'm getting from the person and people I'm talking to. Uh, everybody knows everybody else's business, and that's between, even between the airlines. They all know what's going on, and uh, you know, you know, they know this thing is real. They, they, and that's been told to me. I mean, 
for the most part, they all know that this is something that's, it's just an unexplained phenomena. And, uh, you know, so, well, anyway, guys, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. So, hey, thanks again for coming on tonight. We'll, we're going to go ahead and do this again at some point as this phenomena continues. Uh, I, I'm already looking at a third book for this thing. I don't <laughs> You know, I mean, I you, you guys just got the list I made up the other day. That was over 200 pages and uh, of all the sightings from the very beginning. And uh, yeah, so uh, and just to tell all the folks, us three are going to be working on some projects down the road uh, involving this. So um, just stay tuned. You'll be told when things happen. So that's all I'm going to say at this point. So, guys, you know, uh, Tobias and uh, Emmanuel, thanks again for coming on. And uh, always a pleasure. Talking, always we'll be talking a pleasure. soon. Okay. Thank you. So, if uh, you have an unexplained encounter or sighting, feel free to contact me through the Fams and Monsters blog site. You know, I want to again thank Tobias and Emmanuel for joining me this evening. And uh, and thanks to each and all of you for watching and chatting. If you made a super chat donation, it's truly appreciated. Your support is what makes this possible. Please like, subscribe, and share. And thanks again for being here with our premiere episode at Phantoms and Monsters Radio. So next week we have psychic medium Andrew Radzuski Radz Radz Radzowitz. I'm sorry. Andrew Radsowitz uh, will be joining me from Australia. Uh, Andrew has quite a unique story, actually, and I believe you'll find it interesting. He, uh, he's a former Long Island, New York first responder who later moved to Australia, got married, and became an embalmer at a funeral home. Weird story. But anyway, he is a psychic medium. So... You won't want to miss this. It'll be a quite an interesting show. So until next week, uh, stay healthy and have a safe and enjoyable weekend. Good night.